There's a lot of uh, human violence going on right now. So they're moving. They just moved a hundred thousand people right out of the Congo. Sioux so said she'd been to the village they moved them to. So I don't know what all those people are going to do. They moved them out to make more room for the gorillas. There's not many gorillas left. The mountain gorillas, there's again, 60 left. I feel like the people of the forest should take care of them. There was one group that was living next to the bonobos that just had stick huts, and they were real happy people. And they got forced out. The pygmies. So I guess they were like under five feet tall. And in the 1920s they had that one guy, he was a human pygmy and with the bonobos in the New York City Zoo. Mm -hmm. So there's a book written about him. What was his name? Mm -hmm. was I don't remember his name. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he lived in there with the bonobos. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, why? You can live with the bonobos all the time. Why can't I? <laughs> I mean, but I guess they couldn't see the difference, that there was a difference. Point. Eventually they took him out. And later on he committed suicide. So I don't think he was too happy on the outside. But yeah, I think humans and Bonobos get along just fine. Yeah, she understood everything that we talked about when Pisuke is about to have his surgery. And she understood everything within her realm. They couldn't really go out, and Pemonesia didn't get to go out in cars and look around and see how the world was really made like a real little kid might. But, so that limits her vocabulary, in my opinion. What did she understand about Pixuke Surger? going on but I, I would take her outside and uh, I let her listen to the people they were talking about you know what was going to happen to surgery I'm kind of sorry I did that she, I didn't know that PCK was going to die and I thought you yeah, have a surgery and get better um, he had a hernia which was unheard of But it got better right near the end. It went back up into his body. And, but um, the veterinarian there decided to go ahead and have surgery anyways. And uh, in Des Moines, they didn't have veterinarians who had the experience of working with apes, which personally, I think apes are just like humans. So they need like a human doctor and not a doctor who works on cows and horses and chickens. They need a, like, they're, they're all about exactly like us. That's probably you know, why they want to study them for cancer and AIDS and Ebola. But, um, they're, so, Brigetta was in charge and she had a video crew there. And they were taking the tape over. So, you know, she's having the whole thing videotaped, and she had a machine that was out in the play yard that she was going to use. 
but it was kind of like just dirt was getting all over it. I didn't really think much about it, but um, my husband at the time kept saying, they should never leave that out there and let all that dirt get on there. And I was like, I was like, oh, uh, I don't have any say over this. They don't have any room to put anything. We didn't have much room to store anything. So that's why it was out there. It, it, but I guess it might have got contaminated. I don't really know what happened with a piece of cable. We did have a doctor there who did know a lot about chimps. He was an older doctor, and uh, he had been flown in. And when they put PCK down, I guess his blood pressure was 50. Um, this this person who knew a lot about apes thought the surgery should be discontinued at that point, but they uh, the head vet decided to go ahead with the surgery. Mm. I think they should have stopped the surgery when it was supposed to be stopped. But there's a hand picking order of who's in charge. So you do what the person says to do. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, and they had the surgery down in the kitchen, and Pam and Isha could see it through the window, which I didn't like. Because later she started saying electric shock piece of cake because they had used a defibrillator to try to start his heart again when it stopped. And she saw that. So that's why she was saying electric shock piece of cake at the main keyboard. I mean, I knew that she'd seen it. So. But I was pretty much in shock. I think Takashi was in shock. I think, you know, Sue was really in shock. When did when did Panvenisha say to you electric shock piece of I don't know, but she said it several times. Like right afterwards? We were always uh, Well, I knew what she was talking about when she said it. <laughs> but like right it's after the five, but pretty, it's probably pretty much right right after. I don't know exactly when. Uh -huh. I know that she said it several times. I know I tried to tell people that she was saying that. And they didn't? I mean, I, the only reason I could see that she is saying this is because she had seen what had happened through the window and that's why, and she had been able to figure out that that was electric shock and that it happened to be Suke and that she had figured it out and that she was trying to tell us at the keyboard. I don't know. Why else would she do that? And we didn't expect him to die, of course. And then after he died, she put him up on this platform thing and was wheeling him around. So I don't know how much they know all about death and stuff like that. But I don't You were, and the bonobos were in the mine, and then the, the river flooded, but could you describe a little uh, your life in that oh, very extreme yeah. situation? That was a rather extreme situation. Pam and Isha started saying electric shock water a couple of days before the water got up. I mean, I think she's worried about it being on the wire and stuff. And this was before the road was covered with water or anything like that. And I, I said, well, Pam, he's just saying electric shock water. You know, can somebody come see this? And then the director came up and reprimanded me. I, I mean, he, he's like, why are you saying this? I mean, he didn't believe any of it. I'm pretty sure. Now Beth Dalby was there, outside the window, and I think Pam and Isha said electric shock water to her. That probably impressed her if it, 
she was paying attention, but no one paid any attention to me saying that. And I wondered what was going to happen because they that tsunami had just happened, and all the animals had gone up high before it happened. So they must have felt some kind of vibration or something, I guess. I don't know. Nobody knows about these mysterious type things. But Paymanisha seemed to know ahead of time that it was going to happen, and she was trying to tell us that it was going to happen. So I started trying to tell other people that it was going to, going to happen. And they didn't believe me. They just did not believe me. So um, I remember walking out, telling the two guys they were did uh, built cages and stuff like that and did well and I said like well there's nothing we can do now but it's gonna flood <laughs> and and two days later it did the entire road flooded they couldn't get any cars in it was water was pounding in through the windows um, there was a guy there Serge and his wife probably heard of him, who was raised in Amsterdam where all the water is. So he, he knew a lot about water and what to do. And he had us get bags and stuff. And he helped, told me what to do. And he helped me like put bags on some of the, where, where the water was gushing into the door. So I put some in there. Then I went in where the um, apes were and put it in their cages as well, where the water was gushing in, because he searched and not want to go in the cages with the eggs. And Sue was up there by that point. They let her come help me, but she had been caught. She hadn't been there till that point. But I was glad they let her come in. And it was pretty much like being in a goldfish bowl. You could look out and see the fish swimming around and then you could see fish swimming around inside and snakes and stuff and I didn't know if it was going to go into electrical, out, you know, electrical things and kill us. I was, we were sleeping on top of tables. Dwayne Rambala was very kind and bought us some pants, you know, that they could go up to your hips and cover. So I wore these things up to my hips to walk around in the water and so we were walking around and trying to take care of them and all this water and people were sending blankets we were changing the blankets every day and then I had a net where I was like picking up any debris that went by and they were staying up high so we had four on one side and then three on the other side because we were having the, they had the control group at that point on the right side and the others on the other side. So we went in and Nathan kept getting in the water a lot more than he should have. But, um, he would like take the hose and like, go back and forth. And I don't think the water was very good. I think it was contaminated. So, but there wasn't anything we could do. It just, it just was coming in and knocked off all three trailers down there, knocked them out. And the building was made of concrete, so it pretty much survived it. I don't know how many days we had of that. It was a long time. It was very quiet and still. I remember going outside and the water was way up and looking up at the sky and seeing some... <laughs> it's just... Um, it's very different there. So you, you, you stayed with the uh, with the Bonobos for maybe two weeks or in the during water? the during the flooding? In the water, I don't it's maybe. probably two weeks. I don't remember how long. Yeah. It, there was other people who went into that stayed on the outside. Takashi was there and he helped a lot. And then Suzanne Mazel was there and she went and stayed by herself at night. So we had people staying at night too. 
So you, you spoke of Nathan who was spending maybe too much time in the water. And what about the others? How were they reacting? Kanzi or Panbanisha and Yoda? Well, sometimes Kanzi would walk through the water and up to the top, but not that much. Pretty much they stayed up in the tunnel. Mm -hmm. They either went to one tunnel or the other, and sometimes used the water hoses to get across. And on Matata's side of the building, she just did not move. She stayed in the tunnel and did, did not move. She stayed right there, and then Maisha decided he was going to go up top. And he got up there, and he almost slipped, and he got scared. So he then he was up way top, up in the tower, which is a, about a 30-foot drop, and he did not move or leave or go back with anybody else. So the only way to feed him was to go in there and throw the food up to him so that he could get some food to eat. Otherwise, he didn't have any food. Because, I mean, at least with the tunnel on the outside, we can go, go be on the outside, and you have to be in with them and feed them through the, the wire. But once Maisha went up there and got scared, then, then we had to go in the cage to feed them. Were they afraid? Were they talking during this period to each other? Were they afraid? They were always talking when I was around. <laughs> uh -huh. I had a little bit of a problem with it because I would focus on their talking and then not on people, and then people would get the person I was around would get angry at me and say I wasn't listening to them. But I think I kind of just, in order to hear the sounds, I would. My brain doesn't switch very well between sounds. Like, I just might not hear what they said at the time. So that was a problem. And Kanzi was very concerned when I kept falling in the water, in the flood water, because you couldn't see where this big rock was. So I felt twice, and by the third time he started to tell me vocally, like you say, can they control their vocals? So when I'd just about get to the rock, he had vocalized to me to tell me that it was there so I remember. And you couldn't see it. It was there. And I was about to trip over it. But he would tell me. You know, he'd warn me that the rock was there. And Kanzi could hear all the stuff outdoors, like when there's a guy who died up on the river. I guess they drove a car in there and he he died and Kanzi kept going, wow, wow, wow. I didn't know what he was talking about. He was wow, wow, wow. Well, evidently this guy had died across the way, and there's a ten cop cars out there, and I didn't know about it, and, but Kanzi could hear them talking. And that's what he was trying to warn me about. And I, I couldn't figure it out for quite a while. I was like, why is he doing this? Why is he, tell why is he worried about... Their hearing was supersonic, so they could hear from one side of the building to the other. So if Pamnesia heard some person say green tea down here on this side of the building, like she heard Sue say green, I'm going to go get some green tea once down on, I mean, it, it would be, she, she would say that down on the other side and it would get translated back and forth between the bonobos. Kanzi and Pamnesia were doing something. Kanzi especially was very talkative. So he, um, he would talk all, there would be constant talk, so I don't, it seems really quiet up there, right, and it, you know, when I've gone by, I've been in a long time, as a father some, but they pretty much talked constantly when I was there, and it seems very silent now, like there's no talking, so I don't, constant chatter is gone, the constant talking between them. It's not the kind of life most people would want to live there inside the cage. Especially, I mean, in Des Moines, it's like, it's hard to live inside the cages. I lived inside the cages. But I could leave it, you know. How many years were you there? I was there my whole life. 
until I had the, until after they made me leave. So I was even going in after the tumor. And uh, my hair had grown back out at one point. They put that chunk in my head. And I went in, and I was like, and Matata just took my hand and pulled me right up to the tunnel and started grooming me right where my shunt was. And I was thinking, how does she know where my shunt is? <laughs> Because I, you know, I, it was covered with my hair, there's no way to tell, yet she knew exactly where it was, and as soon as she got me in the cage, she wanted to take care of it. She wanted to groom it and take care of me. So, they didn't, uh, I mean, that's probably why I, I survived, is because had to take care, I was taking care of the animal walking and going in and out of the cages and stuff, but, uh, you know, I had a big tumor and it was like, I had a lot of liquid at one point, it was like all up on my head and everything. <laughs> and I, I remember one time Kanzi and Neota got in the fight, it was back, back when Kanzi, uh, when Kanzi was getting old and Neota was deciding to take over. Was just, I had the tumors all like hanging out of my head. And Yoda started to bite Kanzi, and his tooth thing, I think, got because he had, they were more like little teeny canines with the kind of curved, kind of like, I don't know, it was like, I think it got stuck in there because it wasn't like a real canine or whatever. It got stuck, I don't know what was going on, but he, he didn't stop by it. I don't know what was going on. But I, and then Sue's like, Bill, Bill. And she's in the cage and nobody was. So I just went in there. And as soon as I went in there, they stopped completely. And then I went over and helped Kanzi bandage his bleeding. And uh, Neota was real funny, though. Know? Eventually, he, you know, he was telling Kazi what to do, and he went. Um, Kazi was a little bit of a bully, so he had to back down. And Nyota would take a. He would protect Pamanisha and I, like through in the tower, and Kazi and he were gonna display and have at it. And he would put uh, me and Pamanisha up high, and he'd carry us up and put us up on the shelves so that we would be out of the way while he and Kanzi had their little discussion. <laughs> Who was in charge you. anymore? Neota yeah, ca well, Neota then, carried yeah. you to put you up? Yeah, I was a lot heavier back then. And Pam and Aisha was at least 100, she was 150 pounds. I was pretty big. I was a lot, had, you know, I lost a lot of weight. But, I mean, no, he'd just pick us up and put us up there. And then he would... I don't know, it got worked out after that. There was no more problems between Nyota and Kazi. Nyota didn't beat him up and do anything. So they got along after that. When you came with the tumor, this was not, was this during that period? Or? I probably already had the tumor then. That's it was it was kind of a hard time when I had the tumor because I was really out of it for a few months, I would say. And they like I was in the hospital. So. Did they understand what was going on? Yeah, they understood I had a tumor. So and I I was in with them during the, you know until they told me I couldn't be there anymore and not go do stuff with them and that. That probably got me up and walking and moving around. That probably helped. I mean, I might have just been laying there and never. But I had to take care of him. Somebody had to take care of him. So I got up and walked around and did stuff. And that might have saved my life until Jared said I couldn't be there anymore. But it probably did save my life. They probably saved my life.
Because I'm still alive, and it's 10 years. They told me at three months I had to get my stuff together, I was going to die. And I'd be dead before six months were over. So. Um, yeah, I think they saved my life. And they were always very gentle with me after my tumor. I do have data on Tico, which I need to write up. <laughs> you should do that. I do that. his utterances. I did take down his utterances. Um, Sue had a, had a lot of input into raising Tico. She spent night and day, and I think that was, it's hard to be in there night and day for months and not allowed to leave. Or, or, I mean, we go out and go do things. They don't, they stay in there all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a bit different. It's kind of like being a prisoner, something like that. Tico was born. Sue was in there with him, and he almost didn't survive. So it was a real long birth and the umbilical cord, but he finally did start to breathe. And uh, so we were very happy that he wasn't dead. But he had. He had problems as a baby. Like he, he was very isolated from everybody because he started to cut off, which is probably why he might be autistic, but we don't know. But he was like that and not moving really at all. He was totally cut off. And then Alika started putting him down. So, because he would not cling to her and she wanted to go straight up. And Pam and Isha started participating in the childcare more and more, both with Sue and I. So we were, we were having to trade off a lot, but a lot of it was probably similar, but it might sound the same, even though Sue and I are the yin and the yang. We, we both had similar experiences with Pam and Isha trying to help us with Tico because Tamoli just plain out put him down one time she put him down and she never came out there. I opened these boxes which she could get out and fed through, through them and she never had tried to get out so I just opened the box and I was trying to feed him some food and she just came out and then I was stuck there and she left Tico inside and I couldn't get back through the box and I didn't want to do when the link was out, and she's just... <sighs> uh, that was horrible to me. So I opened up the door, and I went in, and I got Tico. I picked him up, and of course she was elated that I was doing all this stuff and had her out and everything, because she, she wanted to be out and be just like Pam and Isha. But she was already grown up in the control group, and... Uh, I mean, I wish she had been, but that's the way it ended up. I mean, we had mainly all males except for Pam and Isha. I wish we had more females. But she was, Pam and Isha and Alika were very close. And, uh, of course, the females, starting with Matata, I mean, pretty much with Kamachas, you know, they keep their babies near to them, but Matata expected us to do child care from the very start and then Pam and Isha did seem the human way of raising children so she was also that way too. So they both had a lot of, I don't know, I'm taught it always, you come in and she'd give you the baby and I'm like, like, it's your turn to take care of the baby now so <laughs> and I'm gonna go take a break. And it's hard to take care of a kid 24 hours a day, it really is.
you know, I can see why, but we shared in the child care raising and the bonobo females expected Sue and I to share in the child care raising and the, the males actually did quite a bit too. Kanzi did a lot and Yoda did a lot. The the males interacted with Tico all the time and did a lot of the child care too. But between the females it was it's pretty much expected. I mean, everybody knew whose baby was who, but you you were expected to help in the social realm of taking care of the kids. At that point, I was kind of like promising her, well, I'll take care of you when you're old and everything. And so it was really sad to me that when she did need my help, that I was not allowed to go in and help her and give her something to drink. But I wasn't allowed to go really back in there that much. I went a little bit, but uh, Matata wasn't getting enough liquid and what she did was somebody to take in the liquid to her and make sure she's doing okay and drink the liquid and stuff. But at that point, probably because Heather was getting married and now being out of there, I don't know what all was going on, but she died. They didn't let me back in. I mean, they didn't let me back in until after she died, and I've got uh, some pictures of Matata after she died. I got to see her. Um, and then Nyoto got, was really ill. And at, at that point, Heather had come back, and both her and Gayla said, well, we want you to go in with Nyota. I was trying to go in real quiet. I went up and he was like almost dead. I mean, I put, I was squeezing liquid into his mouth and he kept holding his hand out to me for me to touch it like somebody was dying, like I need to hold your hand. Can I just hold your hand and don't leave? So every time I tried to leave, it was like, you would want to hold my hand and I got little bits of liquid in him and he got a little bit better and I got a little bit more in him but he couldn't really swallow or anything I was wetting his mouth down so then after I did that for two nights and then Jared said Liz is making too much noise in there she needs to get out and not be here I don't know. I, I don't know what they did to him. Maybe I, I wasn't there. No, I can only imagine. <laughs> I mean, probably I had to get him away from Matata. Maybe they moved him over. Maybe they um, used the stun gun that goes out 20 feet or whatever. I don't know. But uh, he was almost dead. I mean, I, I'm not a doctor. I'm not saying I know everything. I don't. Uh, so. It was, it was really hard for me to go back to. I know Heather would. Heather stayed a little longer and stuff. She was disappointed when I didn't come. It was, it was kind of hard because when I go, Tico was begging to get out of the cage, and I couldn't take him out. That was hard on me. <laughs> I couldn't go in, I couldn't touch them. There's no contact. You had to wear a mask and it was just it was difficult for me to change that much. I couldn't really do it. And Heather was there trying to help us. She she wasn't I mean she had stopped nursing school. She worked there three years. She was the only person who could go in, take care of all the bonobos and leave at that point. So, and she did that with anybody teaching her. It was the first or second day she went in and took care of all of them and then went back out. But for somebody else, it might be hard to move them. I mean, they might spend all day trying to move them. Most people did. They'd spend all day trying to get them to go from one place to the other. So I don't know. I mean, I just... 
I just want to go in there and talk to them and say, move here, move there, do this, do that. And you go here and you go there. And they always did it. Wherever I said to go, and they knew the names of the rooms. Kanzi picked up the names of the rooms. They didn't really have lexigrams or anything, but he knew what room A was and what room B was and what room C was and the tower and the greenhouse. and So I could tell him just to go anywhere I wanted to and he would go there. But we didn't have lexigrams, but he knew the English. But yeah, that was, I mean, it's all very sad because we've lost so many the nobles there, starting with Pisuke. So, and each time a bonobo is lost, it would trigger something in Sue that was very difficult for her. Not that I didn't have a hard time, too. <laughs> We had three locks on her. We had we had a, top, a lock on the top, in the middle, and the bottom, and that was because there was a possibility Kanzi could reach up to the top and just pull the door off. So they wanted to make sure it was really locked well, and they had a guy from the jails who put the locks in. And um, I would get really confused because somebody with dyslexia had fixed some of the stuff and done it backwards, and I wouldn't. You know, with my right and my left, I would get very confused about which way to go. So, I would, at times when I was having trouble, I would, and people wouldn't have liked this, but I would just take the keys out of my pocket, say, Pam and Isha, open the door, and she would take the keys and open the door, and then give me back my keys, and I'd put it back in my pocket and go on. <laughs> I mean, really, she could be at any time she wanted to be. So. So good, Kanzi. Kanzi is deciding to stay in there right now. But I mean, it's pretty. The wire's pretty good, but I don't know if they got the wire on the inside in the greenhouse. I don't know. But I don't, I'm sure he doesn't want to come out. Why would he choose to stay in? Why? Yeah. Why? Because if he went out, he get shot. I see. Or somebody might hurt him. I see. I mean. Don't you think that sounds a bit scary? Mm -hmm. To go out? I don't think I'd want to be shot. So I hope they get into more of a natural kind of environment where they can have, have enough space and make some choices about what they want to do. Because you know, it's really hard to be in a place where you're not making a choice. I don't, I don't know if you've ever been in the hospital or the nursing home or been knocked out or, or not been able to communicate, but it's kind of kind of like that. And they don't have uh, people to listen right now. I, I don't know what's going on over there. We don't we don't know if they're alive or dead or. We, we have no idea.